Mental health is brain health, which is physical health. It's all about the chemistry in our body. It's not something that we just tell someone to stop doing. And then when Jesse died in April of 2015, I felt like, you know, I, I need to do something to try to at least help someone. From Rotary Magazine, this is the Rotary Voices Podcast. I'm Steve Edwards. In 2015, Lori Kreider lost her nephew to suicide. During a long and ongoing journey of grief, she met another lost survivor, Shirley Weddle. Together, they decided to build a community to prevent suicide by destigmatizing mental health, drawing attention to warning signs, and learning about suicide from various experts. In 2021, they established the Rotary E-Club of Suicide Prevention and Brain Health. In this episode of the Rotary Voices podcast, we'll talk with Lori about how this club came to be, but we begin our conversation with the E-Club's charter president, Shirley Weddle. She gives us insight into the scale of suicide today and shares prevention strategies she finds valuable. Tell us how you got involved in suicide prevention work in the first place. Well, my husband, Brad, and I lost our only child, Matthew, age 22, to suicide in 2014. He was a student at the University of Texas at Dallas, really brilliant, really smart, had a great smile, a great personality, and so much potential. He was actually interested in computer science, neuroscience, and all those different things. He studied philosophy in high school and would ask you these really hard Socrates-type questions that would make your brain hurt. He was a straight-A student and graduated third in his class of over 400 students. He had a tendency to take too many classes. And so he signed up for four classes during the summer and all hard classes. And in Texas, apparently there's a law or uh, a bill that said that if you drop so many classes during your time in college, that you can actually be asked to leave the university. And I don't think he realized that. So he was stressed about that. And we uh, talked to him about him getting some assistance through counseling. But uh, what we didn't know, and this is what happens to so many people, was that he wasn't eating well, he wasn't sleeping well, he wasn't getting the exercise that he normally would. And uh, his friends that he normally would hang out with had gone home over the summer. Uh, also, apparently there was a young lady that he was interested in, and she had a wood friend. And so there was a personal relationship challenge there, too, that we didn't know about. We just knew that he was a stressed-out college student, and so we thought we were working through that. We had a really great conversation right before that happened in July. And that's something that uh, we know now to, to follow up on. Even if somebody's had challenges, you want to follow up when they're starting to feel pretty good, too, to make sure that they're okay. And then uh, apparently over that 4th of July weekend, Matthew had tried to send an email to the young lady. She was with her family and didn't see it. And so uh, we didn't know until she saw it two days later that he had died by suicide. He had left her and he no up. And he had erased everything on his phone and his computer except for two draft messages. I'm a techie person, so he knows that I would look for that sort of thing. But he left the uh, song, I Saw the Light, you know, by Hank Williams. Then we, of course, you know, were devastated when we heard this. The college came to our house, were very kind to us. Then we, we were just in shock, as so many families are. All of a sudden now, you know, our child is not here on earth. I think of the brain, I'm a tricky person. So it's like the final frontier of the body for us to be able to understand. And when people would have an episode, maybe a, a bipolar manic episode or something like that, they didn't know how to address it. In some countries, laws were put into place that criminalized suicide and it, it took property away from people that died by suicide. So that was many, many years ago. Now we find that more and more uh, those laws are being taken away so that people understand it's actually a health condition, just like cancer is a health condition, diabetes is a health condition. And I think that once we show the science and, and let people see what's going on, that hopefully we can get rid of that stigma and people will talk about it. Mental health is brain health, which is physical health. And we think that the way to get rid of the stigma is to really understand that it's all about the, the body, it's physical. It's all about the chemistry in our body. It's not something we just tell someone to stop doing. If someone's having a heart attack, you don't say, stop that heart attack. Just like you're having a brain attack when someone's in that suicidal mind frame at that time. So we wanted to be able to move that focus so that people would understand that it's physical. And that's how we started. 
started calling people that we knew that were involved in various organizations that were interested. And we started with 49 members across four states. 47 of them had never been aerobic. So we were really excited about that too. Help give us a sense of the scale of the issue. Just how prevalent is suicide in the United States? In the United States, around 48,000 people in cheer die by suicide. 48,000. 48,000. And it fluctuates a little up and down. It did go down for a couple of years. But what you thought, oh, wow, it's going down. That's really great news. But what happened is sometimes in certain groups it would go down. But in other groups, like in our minority communities, who are at higher risk of suicide, those numbers actually went up. So you have to look at the whole picture. Your veteran community is at higher risk of suicide. Retirees are at higher risk of suicide because they lose that sense of identity related to their job and their work and those social connections. I tell everyone that you should go to every retiree and tell them to join Rotary. You have the opportunity to mentor and share and work with people, to volunteer, and all those things are really good for your mental health. So Rotary is good for your health. I'd love to go deeper into a few of these communities and demographic groups that you've just referenced. About 17 U.S. military veterans die by suicide every day, according to the latest statistics. That rate is nearly 60% higher than that of other U.S. adults. What are some of the main factors that contribute to that disparity? When you go into combat, a combat veteran, they often then suffer when they come back and become a civilian with moral injury. Moral injury is like a sense of injury to your sense of right and wrong, because when you're growing up, you're taught not to hurt people, not to shoot people and that sort of thing. And you're having to do things in combat that's totally opposite of what you were taught when you're growing up. And so that conflicts with your internal sense of right and wrong. Also, that transition time is part of a military family. They really are family, and they support each other. They watch each other's back. And then when you come back and you transition into civilian life, there's not always that network there for you. And that's why it's so important for organizations to help those veterans transition back into civilian life. And if you think about it, they don't always want to talk about their experience because it's like they're still trying to protect us. They don't want us as civilians to know what they had to go through. And so they're still protecting us in another way. And uh, so it's really important for us then to be supportive and to be there for them, helping them with housing, with their mental health assistance, with jobs and that sort of thing. So anything that we can do to help veterans across the world, actually, is really important for us to do. Another community that feels the disproportionate impact of suicide are indigenous peoples in the United States, which have disproportionately higher rates of a broad array of mental health problems, not just suicide, but PTSD violence, substance use disorders. What can you tell us about what's happening among indigenous communities as it relates to these questions of suicide and mental health? There's trauma that goes on in so far as from the family trauma uh, and PTSD. And so uh, many years ago, many children were taken away from their families and sent to boarding schools and, and not treated well. And there's been lack of uh, services available to our Native American indigenous communities. It's really hard too to find culturally competent counseling. There are not that many people that understand the background to be able to help those that are having challenges. That's another area that we really need to work on is to be able to have culturally competent behavioral specialists to help those people that do go and get help. Geography also plays a role in this with unique barriers facing rural Americans. What are some of those barriers and how does that factor into the picture of support and treatment? What happens is that, and especially nowadays, a lot of the services that are available are available via telehealth, but you don't always have good internet access to be able to access those services. Plus, there's still a lot of stigma in, in certain areas about getting help, that sort of thing. There's the timing, there's the cost too, and transportation. So those are all barriers that we, we come across. And with insurance and the cost itself, sometimes insurance doesn't pay for it. You may not have insurance and people just don't always have the money for that. So that's an area we're really looking at. In fact, our Rotary Club, we started the first rural mental health forum in Northeast Texas this, this year. And we had over 140 people come from seven counties. We were so excited. We're looking at additional avenues 
uh, to be able to get the word out to people and looking at some non-traditional areas like in barbershops. You know, we, we try to go places where typically people don't ask for mental health assistance or look for resources like county fairs, you know, these barbershops and out in community events, just where people go to have fun. So we're thinking about different areas where we can go to reach out to young people. You spoke earlier about the rising rates of suicide among preteens, among younger children. The latest data suggests it's now the second leading cause of death among children aged 10 to 14, and the third leading cause of death among those 15 to 24 in the U.S. What are some of the biggest causes of mental illness and suicide among young people these days that you're seeing? We need to understand that there's development still going on in the brain, too. That up through age 25, your brain is still developing in that frontal lobe area where you make decisions, and in the amygdala, in the temporal lobe, where you control your impulsivity, your fight or flight, that sort of thing. So those are still developing through age 25. So that's part of it. Also, you have certain types of mental health conditions that are more evident in that time frame that make themselves known with episodes and such. Plus, the, the students nowadays, the young people, have so many stresses, much more so than we did because you know social media is out there and that can be a really positive thing, but it, it can also be a negative thing too because you can't make mistakes anymore really when you're a young person and be able to put it behind you because it's all out on social media. And there's a lot of well, bullying that goes on. And I think we don't understand too, sometimes those people that do the bullying might need some assistance also because of things that are going on in their brain. So there's a lot of development going on, a lot of stresses uh, related to social media and even with colleges. Young people now are so worried about what college they're going to get into. And, you know, I need to volunteer this many hours and I need to do this and this and this. And it really is difficult for them. They're trying to be adults at a younger age with a lot more stresses. Surely within the cohort of young people, we also know that lesbian, gay, and bisexual youth are nearly four times more likely to attempt suicide than straight youth. Transgender adults nearly nine times more likely to attempt suicide compared to the general population. What can be done to help reduce those disparities? I think what we can do is really talk and try to understand one another what's going on and looking at the brain science behind everything. Sometimes there are topics that are hard for us to know about or talk about. We are influenced by what we see on TV, what we see on certain news channels or what have you. But we really need to get down and, and think about our family members. Just what if the person in that group is one of our family members? You know, and really talk to, to people and try to understand from their viewpoint what their situation is and to support them. That's the biggest thing for us to talk and to support each other, because that's what we're all about, to support each other and to try to understand what we don't know. One of the main environmental factors that increases one's risk of suicide is access to lethal means. In fact, having access to a gun triples the risk of suicide. Suicide by firearm is a particularly lethal method, as nearly 90% of firearm suicide attempts in the U.S. result in death while only 2% of intentional drug overdoses do. So with that in mind, what can people do to prevent suicide by firearm affecting themselves or, or other people in their lives? A lot of people have a lot of feelings about this, and I think that it's really important for us to see what we all agree upon and what we can do then together. It seems overwhelming at times because really firearm is one of the greatest means by which somebody dies by suicide currently in the U.S. And more males die by suicide than females, often because they do use the firearm. And so I've had personal experience with that in the loss of our son. But I think what we need to look at is how do people get the firearms and how can we keep people safe? And I think that's something we can all agree upon. And one of the first things I think that we can agree upon is that there needs to be some sort of gun locks or something like that related to firearms. And so whenever someone purchases a firearm, is there information available at the counter that talks about resources for suicide prevention? And one of the things that we've been doing, and a lot of people that I know have been doing, is that I've been visiting gun shops and asking if they can leave information there at the counter. And I think they've had some very positive responses on that. Also, whenever you go to a gun range and you go to training, uh, what information is provided to you at that time about suicide prevention so that you can have some resources? 
I know a few of my friends have actually gone to some of those gun ranges and done the training. And when they didn't talk about the suicide prevention, they asked, would it be possible for us to leave some information to be able to share with people? And they were very positive about that. Uh, also, you'll find in some states, they have uh, videos for gun safety in regards to how to lock up your gun or the different types of methodology to do that. In fact, at the Veterans Hospital here in Dallas, North Texas, they provide free gun locks. So they want to make that available to everyone. When you purchase a gun, do you get a free gun lock or at least one that you can post it? Those are some different things that we can do. Realistically, there's a short-term and there's long-term solutions, and it's going to take a while for us to get to a long-term solution, but we do what we can. We have to start somewhere. The Rotary E-Club is active in five states, right, you said? Yes, we've moved from four to five now. We certainly have seen the power of the Rotary community, the global community of Rotarians come together around such major public health issues like polio or malaria. Shirley, what do you hope Rotary might be able to do for suicide prevention and mental health at scale? I am so hopeful. When I learned so much about what Rotary did with polio and to eradicate polio in the world, I think about the over 800,000 people who die by suicide every year. And for every person that dies by suicide, at least 25 others attempt. You think about all of those people across the world. If Rotary's had such an impact in regards to polio, what if we could do the same thing to help prevent suicide? Because Rotary's everywhere with the networks and such kind, caring people. And you think about it, the Robertarians are people you want to have as your friends. Service above self. We know that those are kind and caring people that really want to help. So I think that there's such a possibility that Rotary can make a difference in the lives of people to help reduce suicide, to help people get assistance with their mental health conditions, and for us to help get rid of the stigma associated with talking about mental health, brain health, and, and suicide. I know that the E-Club has actually helped some members recognize their mental health was affecting them. Can you tell me a little bit about the success stories from within the club itself? So many of us have had personal experiences Either we've lost someone to suicide, we've had somebody that struggled or struggled ourselves. And so a lot of what we do helps us and then we support each other too. For example, the walks that we have, the suicide prevention walks at UT Dallas are very personal to me because that's where my son was going to college when he died by suicide. And to be able to have the walks there and to be able to see information with the student body and with the uh, staff there is, is really impactful. And along the way, we've had people from... Um, other organizations from NAMI and that were students there and all that have been able to share their stories. And I think it's been very impactful for those students. We reach out with others of our members who have particular interests in certain areas. We make sure that we support them too, especially on the veteran side. We support each other. And what we don't know about, we learn about. How does one get involved if they want to participate in the Rotary Club? Well, you can email us at the spdhrotary at gmail.com. Uh, they're welcome to email us and, or go to our website or our Facebook page. And we would love to have you visit. You don't have to dress up to come to our Rotary Club. You don't have to get in your car. And if you have information that you would like to share, maybe a presentation or, or something about a certain age group or type of mental brain health, please let us know. We would love to have you visit and join us and maybe present to us also. Shirley Weddle is Charter President and member of the Rotary E-Club of Suicide Prevention and Brain Health. Shirley, thank you so much for sharing your story, your insights, and most importantly, for the essential work you're doing. We're grateful for it. Thank you so very much for allowing us to be here and to share. Lori Kreider is the Club Foundation Chair and a member of the Rotary E-Club of Suicide Prevention and Brain Health. As a founding member, she worked closely with Shirley to establish the club in 2021. Tell us a bit more about your nephew, Jesse Cedillo. What was he like? So Jesse was kind of quiet, but he was into a lot of action. He had, he really exemplified a lot of Rotary characteristics. He was he was service behind the scenes. He was quietly doing things that really most people didn't even know about. The the day that he died, he was actually at service. 
through his church. He had helped pastor with an older gentleman earlier that day, and um, that was a Wednesday. And so he worked with younger kids there at the church, and he also he would work with the older ones. They had a family life center there at the church, and he would play games with the older people. And but he was doing those kind of behind the scenes and not really uh, making a big deal out of it at all. So he was quiet, but but certainly in action in service. To what extent were you and others aware of the challenges that he was facing with his own mental health? Well, we really weren't aware. Unfortunately, he didn't talk about it. He, his sister struggles. She talked about it. He didn't talk about it even with her. But, you know, the hindsight is twenty twenty. And part of what goes with, you know, you always question what could I've done, you know, the dealing with guilt and things like that. But clinical depression runs in my family on my mother's side. My grandmother had clinical depression and had to be on meds until she died in her late 80s. She would start feeling better and go off of the meds and start to tank again. So she just had to stay on those meds until she died. So there's clinical depression, which now we obviously know he did have clinical depression also dealt with some anxiety, but he also had some pain issues, some back pain, and he had some sleep trouble. And so serotonin levels can definitely be a risk factor for suicide. So looking back again in hindsight, see that there's not just one thing that's, well, this happened, so that must be why they took their life. It's a combination of things. One in four people will struggle with some sort of mental health issue in their life, so it's very common. But we tend to think, oh, I must be the only one. So talking about it can really save lives. What inspired you to do this work in the first place? It started really back in 2015 when Jesse died. Unfortunately, I'd had some other losses with an aunt back in about 1998. I had a friend in 2005. And then when Jesse died in um, April of 2015, I felt like, you know, I I need to do something to try to at least help somebody. And um, so I became acquainted with the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, AFSP. Got involved with them. They had an annual walk. And um, so I went and joined that walk and made some key connections there. Met a lady at that walk who had organized through Highland Park Methodist Church, a group called the Christians Providers of Suicide Loss Support Group. So this was just a support group for people who had had that loss because it's a different loss than others. And so we found that it was very helpful for people to have a place to come together and share experiences with people who knew that particular loss. But I got into it to try to just specifically, hopefully keep other people from dying from suicide, but also to support those who have had that loss and to let people know that they're not alone. Let's talk more about that important ingredient in all of this. And I want to break it up into a few component parts. The first is just to dig a bit more into some of the signs to watch for. If you suspect a loved one, a close friend, a family member, a colleague, what have you, someone in your life might be contemplating suicide, what are some signs to look out for? Be looking for changes in things like, say, things that they like to do normally, that they're maybe pulling away from. They're not doing those things that they enjoy. They may be giving away prized possessions. They could even be excessively, seemingly happy all of a sudden. Most people, when they take their life, they're not necessarily wanting to die. They just want pain to end. So they may see that, hey, now I've got a plan. And I see my pain ending, so they may seem upbeat after having been pretty down for a while. So those are some of the things to look for. Once you've identified the potential signs, what are some of the precautions one can take to prevent someone from taking their own life? Well, first of all, talk to them. A lot of people think, well, if if I mention suicide, that may make them more likely to do it. But that is not the case from the research that AFSB has done. It's a good thing to just ask them, are you thinking about hurting yourself? Are you thinking about doing this? Do you have a plan? Just asking those questions. I want to point out to anybody who may be listening, if you are contemplating suicide or someone you know may be contemplating suicide, 
the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline in the United States, which is available through a phone call or texting at 988. That's just the number, 988. You can also visit findahelpline.com, all one word, findahelpline.com. If you are outside the U.S., doctors and counselors recommend creating a written safety plan about what to do and who to contact and what to tell yourself if suicidal thoughts are rising for you or you feel out of control. I'm curious, we were talking about the conversation that a friend or loved one might have, but why is that last piece so important? What would be some good examples of things to include in that plan for somebody who may be feeling these feelings? Well, one thing that uh, could be done is to get even a written agreement from them to to not do anything without talking to you. And it may be on the AFSP side. You can find a, a little script that you could have them actually sign as a commitment to not take that action. But you could also just verbally ask them, will you reach out to me before hurting yourself? Get that commitment from that person. So engaging in things that you find enjoyable, engaging in nature are things that can be helpful in improving our mental health, of course. What role does connection play in mental health and in particular in preventing suicide? How can someone increase or leverage connections in their own life to really benefit their mental health? Well, I think that is super important and the best possible thing that I can throw out there for a super way to connect is to get involved with Rotary. It can be in in-person clubs or it can be in an e-club like our club. One of the really cool things about Rotary is that once you are a member of Rotary, you're then free to visit any Rotary club around the world. So you're part of the Rotary family, but you're also involved in service. And service is very good for the mental health anyway. Get your mind off of your problems and helping someone else that can be extremely beneficial and then you're serving with people who have that same desire so it's a great way to connect and make meaningful relationships with really awesome people so that would be my highest recommendation but you know getting involved in other groups that are doing things that you like to do that you enjoy so if you like hiking and you want to get involved in hiking groups then that can be a great way to get connections you mentioned Rotary and the work that Gordon McAnally is doing to raise awareness, but you, of course, have also been central to Rotary's efforts. In particular, you've been very involved in the Rotary E-Club of Suicide Prevention and Brain Health. And I'm curious to know, how did that club come to be and how does it actually implement its work and mission? So it came to be with the opportunity for clubs to form based on a cause versus a location. So at that point, past District Governor Linda Elliott you know, maybe you should look at chartering something for the mental health. So we came up with this idea of suicide prevention and brain health because basically mental health is brain health is physical health. So we wanted to focus on that piece. And I was connected with Shirley Weddle through the AFSP. So I reached out to her to see if she would be interested in doing this. She was very passionate about jumping on board. And tell me a little bit more about the members of the E-Club. Who are they and what are some of the stories that stand out for you? Many of those members are directors or very involved in organizations that support this initiative. But we also just have people in general that have either lost someone to suicide or maybe they struggle themselves. We have military veterans that are involved and as most people know, suicide is a major issue with our military. It's said that it's 22 veterans per day die by suicide, but they think that's underreported and it's probably actually higher than that. So many of our members are military veterans. Lori, one of the things that we haven't talked about is just the way in which we can be thinking about our own mental health. And one of the things that experts emphasize is the importance of daily habits that can improve our own mental well-being. I'd love to close this conversation by giving listeners some of the things they can immediately do to help diminish depression and anxiety and protect their peace. What are some of the things that you recommend for others or may do in your own daily life 
to protect our mental health? Well, I would recommend carving out time to do things that you really enjoy. And, you know, even if that's just 20 or 30 minutes to focus on that can be very helpful for myself. I love to get out in nature. And if that's only 20 minutes, then that's okay. Many days I may have an hour or two or three out in nature, out in the woods on hike and trails. There's quite a bit of uh, benefits from just being out in nature, breathing that forest air bathing that comes from the Japanese term of Shinrin Yoku. And back in the early 80s, the Japanese sent business people out into the woods, and as they would go in, they would do a little mini psych evaluation and they would measure things like cortisol levels, heart rate, resting heart rate, blood pressure, and things like this. And then they would measure them coming out and they would see those levels drop. It doesn't necessarily have to be out at a, a national park or something. You can even maybe do that in your backyard. You know, if you have physical limitations, you can't get out into uh, the middle of the woods. Just that, just sitting around and breathing that has more benefits than we can realize. But for me, the seeing of all the beauty out in nature, the smells that you pick up while you're out there, it just really brings some relaxation to me for sure. Lori Kreider is an advocate for mental health and suicide prevention. She's a Rotarian, having joined Rotary as a member of Rotary Club of Dallas Uptown in 2010. Now based in Alabama, she is a member of the Rotary E-Club of Suicide Prevention and Brain Health. Lori, thank you so much for this conversation and most importantly for the important work you do. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about it. This episode of the Rotary Voices podcast was produced by J.P. Swenson and edited by Wen Wong with production by Mike Novak. If you enjoy this podcast, please rate us five stars on Apple Podcasts and Spotify and share it with your friends. The Rotary Voices podcast is produced by Rotary Magazine, the official monthly publication of Rotary International. I'm Steve Edwards. Thanks for listening.